You are now tuned in to the Storm Tracker Podcast. Welcome back to the Storm Tracker Podcast. I'm Marcus Benjamin, representing for CanesCounty.com, part of the Rivals Network. And I'm joined today by John Garcia, also part of the Rivals Network. He's the Southeastern Analyst. And he's kind enough to join me today for our Friday segment. You know, we're going to try to keep this going. I know John's a busy man, uh, but it's called Rivals Friday. So the big news coming out of South Florida is five-star Josiah Trader commits to the Miami Hurricanes. Now, this is something that we kind of figured uh, would probably happen. Um, I think always thought that Miami was the leader here. And I I think when the announcement happened, it kind of caught us, you know, somewhat by surprise that it was that particular uh, day. Um, And, but it wasn't a surprise as far as contact is concerned, because Miami has been in extreme contact with him pretty much from the jump. And it's kind of increased since, Kevin Beard, the Miami wide receivers coach, kind of jumped on board. But your thoughts, John, on the timing of Trader making his decision to commit to the Hurricanes? Yeah, I, I thought the timing was was everything for Miami in this race. Uh, like you said, everything had been building up to Miami at worst being a major, major contender in this race. But really, since KB was hired – and we got closer to, to the end of the spring into the summer, Josiah started admitting to us, hey, Miami's got this full court press on me where it's not just the receivers coach and the head coach, it's everybody. And, and he's admitted, look, Miami's in contact way more than other schools. And when you're a five-star and there's a gap in communication between one and whoever's two, three, four, and five, that's a really big deal. So even a kid like Jojo, who every time we went on the record, it was like signing day after the season. I'm not doing anything early. No official visits in, in June, unlike 99% of, of the college football recruiting world. Everything in his plan pointed to a later decision. But everything recently with Miami pointed to that prioritization that, look, even if you're a kid who's been recruited for two, three, four years, by all these great programs and great coaches, it matters. When your inbox is is steadily green and orange, it matters. Um, Not to mention, you know, some of these other recent commitments that have jumped on for UM here recently. I know we've we've written a lot uh, about um, Mr. Mack committing from St. Thomas and how that uh, was really a, a bubbling up type moment for a lot of these Miami Gardens Ravens players. Uh, which I'm sure that will be a storyline throughout this cycle um, in in South Florida and certainly for Miami. But, you know, go back to Legends Camp. He gets an opportunity to work with Kevin Beard one-on-one and and kind of admits, you know, hey, I've got it from an athleticism standpoint, but I need the intricacies. I need the little details. So he gets that first impression with Beard. Um, and he works out at the Legends Camp in June, but he wouldn't have worked out if Mac hadn't driven him down to Coral Gables. Um, and if Mac hadn't worked out that day, Josiah wouldn't have worked out that day. So again, you, you're just seeing sort of the product of circumstance that Miami has basically created to not only stay at the forefront of the trade or recruitment, but to really kind of go all in into moving up his timeline five or six months ahead of when he wanted to originally lock this thing down. And and when he committed, you know, he told us, I just, I just feel like I got to be home. I mean, it's, it just was this sort of bubbling up moment for Miami. Uh, so to, to flip a recruitment like this is a really big deal. I know we'll get into the, the greater ramifications, but even to move up a timeline for a five-star like this is a really big deal. And I think it's a very good sign for the depth of, of this, uh, this program's recruiting ability. And, and obviously traders a name, you know, that, that matters, that carries weight when you're talking about 
who else Miami might be able to bring in. So in just about every way, shape, or form, this was huge, albeit surprising news uh, Thursday night. Absolutely. Uh, timing is everything, and the stars aligned, it seemed, you know, and him being a five-star aligning, so to speak, or teammates with other five stars on a Chaminade team that is absolutely loaded. I mean, it's it's one of two schools, them and Buford out of Georgia with three five-star rated kids. The teammates that he has with him, Jeremiah Smith, and recently upgraded to a five-star Zaquan Patterson. Now, you talked about the Miami Gardens Ravens, the purple machine that is starting to, you know, turn into the orange and green machine, so <laughs> to speak here, um, with the additions of Ryan Mack. OJ Frederic was also on that team. Vincent Shavers also on that team. They're all committed to Miami. But uh, Jeremiah Smith, you know, is another guy that's out there on that team. Wayne McCoy, another guy. Uh, prospect committed to Florida State was on that team. Uh, a couple others are still out there. But uh, the commitment to of Trader to Miami has huge ramifications. And I'm kind of alluding to it with Chaminade, his high school, and his former youth football team. But what does this really mean to not only get him from potential pipelines, but also beating out the rivals, you know, beating out Florida and Florida State for uh, this prospect. He was, I would say, maybe in midsummer, he, he was getting some a lot of seminal love. And then uh, the gate kind of jumped in as well. So what does it mean for, for Miami to get a player like him, add him to the class, and now – eventually compete for the top class in the state. Right now, they're still trailing Florida State and Florida. Miami has the 17th ranked class. Florida State currently at 13. And Florida, who's been on a roll, is at four. So what does his commitment eventually mean or ultimately mean for this 2024 class for the Canes? Yeah, I think he's sort of he'll be the face of the ceiling of this Miami class, right? Um, it was always going to be a good class, always going to be a top 25 group. You just know with Mario Cristobal's track record, the O-line group's going to be heavy. We've, we've heard a lot of hype about what the D-line group could be in 2024, but really it's about hitting the highest level. And, and that is the one thing early in Cristobal's tenure that he hadn't really accomplished. Now, in 2023, you had some huge local additions, right? Ray Ray Joseph, former Clemson commit, huge yeah. to get him on the commitment list. Mark Fletcher was committed to Ohio State, huge Absolutely. to get him on the commitment list. Ruben Bain, maybe the most productive pass rusher down here in quite a while, huge yeah. to get him on board. But none of those guys had the fifth star next to their name. You know, those are the, the only local prospects that have eluded Crystal Ball to this point. Branton Ennis, Shamar Stewart. Um, those players over the last couple cycles didn't end up at the U, despite a really consistent effort, um, you know, from from the program. So I, I think it it kind of validates you getting over one of those final hurdles from a recruiting standpoint. And then when you when you go to the pipeline, if if you could have selected six months ago, a year ago, hey, what's one high school where Miami's going to make a splash and it's going to make a huge difference? I think a lot of Miami fans would have said, let's let's go for Shaman on Madonna because yeah. there was there's been kind of this, I don't know, mystique. I don't know if that's the right word. There's been this thing where it's like, hey, a lot of these great Shaman on players don't end up at Miami. There's only two Shaman on players on the current Miami roster. There was kind of, I, I guess, a question relative to pulling from that that elite pipeline. And now you pull the second best player on a roster with, as you mentioned, two more five stars, um, not to mention some other great 2024 and certainly 2025 players. So now you're pulling from a new, basically what feels like a new pipeline, even though it's right there in your backyard. So I think even getting over that theoretical hurdle 
is a big deal for Miami in this case. So I just think Trader, he just sort of validates a lot of why Mario Cristobal was hired. You know, this this was the vision. That was my tweet yesterday. It was like the vision was not only are you going to keep Dade and Broward talent home in general, we all knew that was going to be an upgrade, but it was about contending for the elite. You know, Georgia offered Josiah Trader first. FSU was trending, as you mentioned. Florida had tried to get back in the race. Um, he wanted to get back to Ohio State, where Jeremiah is committed. He talked about Penn State and Oregon as recently as last month, trying to get first impressions with those schools because he was in no rush to make a decision. So you, you, you trump all of that in very short order, and, and it just starts to pile up in, in what it means. So I just think JoJo represents the ceiling of what you know Miami's recruiting potential could be. And, and now – you got to feel like it's game on, you know, is, yeah. is Jeremiah that much more inclined to maybe staying home? Certainly Zaquan Patterson, even before Trader popped, you felt pretty good about Miami's chances there. Uh, so, so this pipeline with, with Shamanad looks like it's, it's just beginning with Trader. And that's about as welcome news for Miami fans. I would imagine as, as any other school or any other individual recruit could bring. Yeah, I, I agree that, the the acquisition i guess you could say is is big for the miami class no doubt but i would maybe disagree a little bit that, that it's the ceiling it could they could get other five stars here you know they're they're in the race for like a camarian franklin you know um you know colin simmons did visit miami albeit a long shot um but that there could be some other guys in the pipeline as far as five stars and that but i think like you said though this puts them in the game. This puts them in the game for those five stars. This puts them in the game for an, a back-to-back -back top 10 class. So we'll see kind of how it all plays out. But back to JoJo, man. JoJo is a dynamic athlete. We actually have him as an athlete um, here on Rivals, which means he's versatile. He can, he can play a, a number of different uh, positions and a position that he's played in seven on seven and at Chaminade is safety. Uh, he's, he's played that at a very high level as well, but um, of course he's an outstanding wide receiver has, has amazing hands, great catch radius, great uh, after the catch as well can build up that yak. What are some of the things that kind of stand out to you with Jojo as an athlete? Yeah, let's let's start right there, right? Like you said, two-way guy who, man, we just we joke about it. I joke about it at this point with him. I'm like, can you play a little more DB for us, please? Because you know, we we really feel like that he could be ranked even higher. I think he's the number 13 player in America right now as a two-way guy. If he kind of embraced that DB ceiling, this this could be number one DB in the country type status uh, if he really leaned in all the way that way. But to JoJo's credit, he likes offense better. Uh, he yeah. said he'd rather be chased than to be the one chasing, which I understand uh, to a certain degree. But the skill set is yeah. there. 6'1", 175 pounds. He's finally healthy. I think the there's been some fluidity with his ranking elsewhere because he missed a bunch of spring ball, didn't run yeah. track. Uh, and was kind of banged up through yeah. most of 2023. But yeah. dealing really with at that leisure camp, injury. yeah, he was the surprise performer uh, that we weren't expecting to see. And since then, he's looked all the way back. Like, oh, JoJo's back. You know, one-handed catches are back. Getting downfield is back. The competitiveness with him is is all the way back. So you like to see that. Um, but, yeah, we, we didn't waver much on, on the ranking because we know when healthy – you know, who he is and, and the type of talent he he presents. And I think, uh, like I said earlier, from a receiver standpoint, he's got all the raw tools. 6'1", 180, you mentioned probably the best hands in South Florida, which says a lot considering yeah. who his teammate is, you know, kind of the unanimous <laughs> number one receiver in the class. Um, but everything else pre and post catch is electric with JoJo. He can run. He can absolutely elevate. You, you mentioned the catch radius. It's there. And he's pretty polished as a route runner. I think he still has some room to progress there, just like he has some room to fill out physically and play a little bit more, um, you know, with an edge at the point of contact. 
But as he starts adding those things to his arsenal, you can understand when he is, is playing just receiver, which he's really never been able to do, you could see how very quickly he could become that alpha, that wide receiver one for any of the schools that were that were recruiting him. So it's good to see him healthy. Like you said, timing is everything. Uh, he's, he's going crazy and viral on social right now anyway. Uh, yeah. So really good timing for Miami to to grab him and, and for those clips to remind folks as to why uh, he is a five star. And, and he was at one point, I would assume, a unanimous five star recruit. You know, I think with guys like Jojo, who have been named since eighth and ninth grade, we tend to over scout them. We see them so much that the body of work creates more negatives than it would for a, a late riser or a guy that you haven't seen as much. So we we kind of dock those recruits for that overexposure. Um, so we're always actively trying to push against that, at least here at Rivals, and, and kind of take the body of work for what it is and take the positive more than anything else. So uh, it's good to see him kind of reminding a lot of people, hey, this is why, uh, you know, 50 schools have offered me and everybody wants me to play something uh, on their roster. So, yeah, JoJo, there's a reason why this is all a big deal. And, and it, it always has begun with the talent that Trader possesses. Trader is just productive. He, he is a productive receiver and night in, night out, seven on seven, game in, game out. He's always productive, scoring touchdowns, making a highlight play, making a viral moment. And I think there is thoughts that, oh, um, because of his size, maybe he doesn't um, project as high to the NFL because these, these uh, star systems are kind of based on how do they project to the NFL. And I've heard from some analysts that, Oh, he he doesn't project to the NFL as as great as others, um, you know, based on his size. But I, I think I think the production is something that you can't ignore. And I think based on him also being on one of the best teams in the country in Chaminade, that is just going to continue this year. I mean. Ever since he was at, uh, you know, he, he he shined a little bit at pace, but not a lot. But when he got to Central, he really kind of showed what he can do. And he showed what he could do on the defensive end as well. I don't know if you remember, John, but he returned a about a 100-yard interception for a touchdown. And that was actually his first play at, at DB uh, for uh, the Rockets, who would go on to win. Uh, the state championship that year. So the I think he's going to stay a five-star. I'm saying all that be, because, <laughs> you know, I think he's yeah. going to stay as a five-star because um, of, of the production that he will continue to, um, you know, produce over there. Can, at we, can we nerd out for a second here, Marcus? What's, what's that? I said, can we nerd out for one second if we're yeah, talking yeah. NFL? Sure. <laughs> I just pulled up the 2022 NFL leaders um, among wide receivers. OK, yeah. So if we say Josiah Trader doesn't maybe project like that A.J. Brown type of wide receiver, 6'3", 200 pounds, whatever. Yeah. Here are the guys who led the league in receiving. Justin Jefferson, 6'1". Tyreek Hill, well under six foot. I think we all understand that. Devontae Adams, 6'1 yeah. and a half. A.J. Brown, who we mentioned, Stephon Diggs, who is six foot, C.D. Lamb, who is six two, Jalen Waddle, well under six foot, Devontae Smith, six foot, Terry McLaurin, six one. You see where I'm getting at here? I'm on Ross St. Brown, six foot. Josiah is six one, one eighty right now as a as a rising senior in high school. So, um, yeah, is he running a Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, forty yard dash? Probably not. Yeah. Um, but as you said, productive against elite competition at every turn, uh, which were some of the traits that some of these other guys possessed. Out of all those we mentioned, I think only A.J. Brown is truly bigger, taller and bigger than Josiah Trader as a 17-year-old rising high school senior. So if it's about the NFL projection, um, yeah, for every for every big physical, you know, freak of nature, 
there's seven, eight, nine guys at the top of the leaderboard that are in that six foot, six foot one range or much shorter yeah. that are getting it done at the highest level. So I think some of those, it's just, it's just a double-edged sword. If you want to play the NFL game, is it measurables or is it production that you're looking at? Who, who are we? Are we comping the combine or are we comping the players? And and yeah. to me, it's always about comping the players. Again, those are all great players, all their own paths to the league, but size is 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 not common uh, between the, those those players. So I think right. that's always important to know. And look, football is is widening every year, uh, so the size matters. A little bit less. So when when we get into that projection game relative to the NFL, I'm always it, it's always like a you spin it how you want to spin it, I guess. Um, so it's like, are we comping the combine or are we comping the players? And if you're comping the players, JoJo has that type of juice that you could absolutely imagine propelling him to Sundays one day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I'm always a, a guy who comps the players. You know, I, I like to see what you do on the field. And Jojo, the productive, one of the most productive players in the entire country. It'd be very interesting to see how this season plays out as Chaminade has a gauntlet of a schedule um, starting with Miami Northwestern in game one. All right, let's move on to who's next for Miami, possibly. Um, well, today they are in the top three for a Teddy Roberts out of Sarasota. And then tomorrow they are in the top schools list for outstanding tight end out of Georgia, Caleb Odom. Just your your quick thoughts on, on those two guys and and what are the chances that Miami lands those two prospects? Yeah, uh, Foster's this sort of late riser out of Sarasota, lengthy corner who really it felt like the ball has been in Florida's court for quite some time. Um, we've also seen Miami take several cornerback types recently. We talked about Ryan Mack earlier. Uh, we talked about OJ, Frederic uh, on board as well as it's maybe a hybrid secondary player. We know um, Zaquan is in the crosshairs as well. So starting to wonder what the DB space looks like because a couple early commitments from Miami were also in the secondary. So I'm wondering how many slots Miami does have there. But that notwithstanding, I think you know, this this Sarasota kid was probably leaning towards Florida anyway for quite some time. Um, I know before we jumped on, you were surprised Miami even made his top group. Um, so yeah. um, I think Miami and North Carolina are the other two schools there. But this one has felt like Florida's race uh, for quite some time. And I think Caleb Odom is a lot more interesting for, for Miami. This is a kid who I, I would say with Miami passing on other tight ends has obviously prioritized a Caleb Odom, um, but so have so many other schools. You know, for rivals, he's the top ranked uncommitted tight end in America right now. So um, your Auburns, your Alabamas, your Ole Misses, everybody's been all in on on Caleb Odom. Um, so I think that recruitment has trended and changed a little bit over the last six months. Miami had some buzz. Ole Miss had some buzz. Bama certainly has the most buzz leading into this thing. Um, but but Caleb doesn't strike me as one of those kids who's playing games. I think he's legitimately going back and forth here. Uh, and he doesn't talk a lot. So I do think there is a, a more than a puncher's chance for Miami with this recruitment uh, on Saturday, particularly because uh, I think a couple of those other programs we mentioned uh, for in, in the running for Caleb, they've got tight ends already verbally committed. I know Miami does too, but not the type of tight end, the style of flex tight end that Caleb Odom uh, would present. So I, I do think that'll be interesting to see on Saturday from the Miami perspective. I'd have more eyes on the Odom commitment relative to uh, really any others this week. And although, as Thursday taught us, you never say never. You could be surprised here uh, for, for an elite recruit pushing up his timeline sort of unannounced. So that'll be interesting to see as well. Definitely will be interesting to see. Miami claims the moniker of tight end U. So we'll see if they add another great one to their class, along with Elijah Lofton, who I do like a lot. Uh, you know, they, they did uh, miss out on a, on a Kylan Fox and, and others. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, but right now, it seems to be a lean to Alabama. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's still up in the air and a lot can happen 
in this recruiting game, especially from, from now until, until the day of. More updates on canescounty.com. Check our message board uh, for any updates in regards to Caleb Odom and other players as well. John Garcia, ladies and gentlemen, the Southeast analyst for Rivals.com. Make sure you subscribe to Rivals.com and subscribe to CanesCounty.com as well. Use the promo code Miami30. You see it scrolling on the bottom there. Also subscribe to this YouTube channel live from Canes County. Uh, we've grown exponentially, John. I mean, it's it's been a year and it, we've already have nine thousand subscribers. Uh, some of our some of our videos have over a million, um, no, a couple million views. So. Uh, we're continuing to grow here at Rivals. A lot of great things on the horizon uh, with Rivals as well. And hopefully we'll we'll see you again uh, sometime soon here on this podcast. Sounds good, my friend. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. And that's going to wrap it up for the Storm Tracker podcast. Until the next episode.